Okay, great. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Uh, thanks for the organizers for um, for inviting me. And uh, unfortunately, it's it's very early here in California, so I had to miss some of the previous talks. But I will catch up on the recordings. Uh, okay, so yes, I'm going to talk about our recent work on uh, modular quantum circuits and approaching them through this concept of space time duality. So here are the references. Um, and also, there was a recent work by uh, Tarun Grover's group at uh, UC San Diego on some related um, ideas. So, um, as you might have heard, uh, these monitor circuits give rise to uh, entanglement phases in their late-time states. And so, I want to start by just introducing, uh, you know, the basics from from entanglement. Right. So, uh, we uh, imagine we have a, an isolated quantum system with some many-body wave function on it. We can ask about the entanglement entropy of some subsystem A, which is some continuous block of of spins, for example. And we know that uh, the entanglement, uh, you know, plays a key role both in quantum computation as a as an ingredient for 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 advantage of various kinds, but also in uh, understanding quantum matter, so understanding which phase of matter we are in in this many body state. So, for example, if we are in a in a in a gapped ground state, uh, we know that entanglement scaling is based on area law, so it scales only with the size of the boundary of this region uh, because there is short range entanglement. So only degrees of freedom near the boundary can get entangled. Uh, but then also we may have topological order, which comes with some uh, universal correction on top of this. So we can learn universal facts about our phase just from looking at entanglement. Then we can look at gapless uh, ground states such as at quantum critical points. And, and here we may have a logarithmic divergence of entanglement. And finally, we can look at, uh, for example, highly excited uh, eigenstates of a Hamiltonian in which we have uh, volume loss scaling. So a uh, finite density of entropy uh, with all degrees of freedom in the region contributing some entanglement. Um, and in particular, this latter case is important for understanding uh, the basics of quantum thermalization. So uh, how an isolated quantum many body system can approach uh, thermal equilibrium, which can sound a little uh, counterintuitive at first because we have some intuition that equilibration is an irreversible process and, and quantum dynamics on the contrary is perfectly uh, unitary and reversible uh, at least in an isolated system and so uh you know this might seem a little counterintuitive but the key to reconciling this these two ideas is through entanglement right so uh if we have a subsystem in a, in a bigger isolated system and and as time goes on uh, it develops uh, extensive entanglement, then its reduced density matrix might approach a, a thermal um, density matrix. And so you might recover locally the expectations of, of thermal equilibrium. And this is the basis of, of ETH and related ideas. So um, this means that information, even though it's not destroyed by unitary dynamics, it's hidden in, in, in non-local degrees of freedom or it's scrambled. And, and so it becomes locally inaccessible. And as um, Adam discussed in his uh, talk just now, uh, quantum circuits have emerged as a really powerful um, tool for understanding and studying how this quantum information gets scrambled. So uh, quantum circuits are just uh, at the same time uh, interesting from the theory standpoint and from the experimental standpoint. So as, as theoretical models, they uh, allow you to uh, strip down all the structure from, uh, say, a Hamiltonian dynamics and reduce it to the bare minimum of unitarity and locality, which is very powerful. But also in experiment, these are the uh, natural ways of operating of digital quantum simulators. So um, they are just interesting uh, at the intersection of interesting developments, both in theory and experiment. Um, so um, with, with, uh, with quantum circuits, we can understand uh, universal aspects of the approach to equilibrium, such as uh, you know, the growth of entanglement, spreading of operators, onset of quantum chaos, et cetera, which is very uh, important from the standpoint of understanding foundations of quantum statistical mechanics. But what if we wanted to understand uh, or, or discover universal physics, not in the approach to equilibrium, but in, in late time states themselves? So what if we wanted to have non-equilibrium phases where the late time evolution does not converge to equilibrium? And here we run into um, an abstraction seemingly uh, in that if we if we have sort of unconstrained growth of entanglement in a, in a model like a random quantum circuit, then yes, we can uh, learn about uh, this growth of entanglement, for example, but at late times we saturate to a state which is uh, infinite temperature. And, and in, therefore it's completely featureless and any sort of quantum correlations we might measure uh, are, uh, you know, are not going to show us any interesting quantum order. So we won't be able to uh, find phases in such uh, you know, trivial late time states. So uh, this motivates you know, the search for various ways of escaping this kind of heat death. 
And some of the approaches that have been used, and we've heard about these in several uh, talks in this conference, are, um, for example, many body localization in which strong disorder or detuning uh, prevents you from equilibrating, um, but also uh, a family of approaches that go by pre traumatization where, yes, you do achieve equilibrium at very late times, but you, but you engineer some long and tunable time scale over which you can stabilize uh, non-trivial states. And then also we've heard a, a, a fair amount about uh, the superspace fragmentation, which can arise either exactly due to uh, symmetries and conservation laws, or in a sort of approximate pre-thermal way with a tilt in a, in a say, in a cold atom system. Uh, but finally, uh, what I want to focus on in this talk is a, is a newer uh, or you know a very recent approach that has been that has attracted lots of interest, which is based on monitoring a quantum system. So. Um, uh, and a classical agent going in and measuring degrees of freedom as the dynamics goes on, and in doing so, uh, lowering the entropy and, and allowing potentially for the stabilization of, of interesting uh, phase structure in late time states. So these monitored circuits are based on the idea of integrating uh, measurements in the dynamics. And um, when we first learn uh, quantum physics, we, we find out that there are fundamentally two ways in which a quantum system can evolve. So if we are not looking at it, then it obeys uh, Schrodinger's equation, and its evolution is deterministic and, and it's smooth in time. But when we look at it, uh, and we couple it to some, to some uh, measurement device, then the evolution is uh, non-deterministic, so there is some intrinsic randomness, and it's also discontinuous, given by this kind of uh, wave function collapse that um, uh, describes the measurement process. And so this might not be the ultimate fundamental description. Maybe there is a more there's a deeper unification of these two things, but certainly on a uh, as a matter of of, of daily uh, practice, this is how things uh, seem to work. So uh, typically, we don't worry so much about this process because it's viewed more as a probe of the underlying unitary dynamics. So we simply worry about understanding, uh, say, Hamiltonians or, or, or circuits, and then and then we measure everything at the end, and we don't really have to worry about this collapse. Um, but in this uh, recent wave of, uh, of, of works on monitored circuits, we're trying to uh, elevate measurements from, from probes of the dynamics to active components uh, that are playing a, a, a role in their own right. And what's interesting about this is that this, this framework gives rise to uh, phases of uh, you know, late time uh, non equilibrium states that are defined by their entanglement scaling. So very much like in, uh, in, in, in the Hamiltonian case, we may have area law, uh, logarithmic divergence, or, or volume law, depending on where we're looking in the spectrum. Uh, uh, here we can have all these phases, but, but they're all uh, completely out of equilibrium. And they're related to interesting ideas in um, quantum uh, information science, including uh, complexity of certain sampling tasks and the theory of quantum error correction. So, so they lie at an intersection of many interesting uh, ideas in condensed matter and quantum information. So to give you a bit more detail about the kinds of phase structure we find um, in these circuits, let us consider a setup where we have um, quantum circuits made out of, of gates like this with uh, interspersed by measurements on single qubits at a certain rate uh, given by P. So it turns out that if, if this rate P is sufficiently large, then uh, the measurements successfully uh, read out the local information and disentangle the state. And, and in one dimension, this translates to a constant amount of entanglement, which is efficient to simulate on a classical computer. But then as we lower our rate of measurements sufficiently, we at some point we hit um, with a critical point where the entanglement has a logarithmic divergence, very much like in a Hamiltonian critical point. And eventually we transition into a phase where uh, late time states of the circuits have volume law entanglement. And we can understand this as, in some sense, the unitary evolution um, winning this competition and, and successfully hiding the information from the local measurements in, in non local degrees of freedom where it can be uh, protected and stored for long times. So, more formally, this, is, um, this describes the formation of a, a quantum error correcting code spontaneously, dynamically. Uh, and, and as a result, these states are, despite being volume law, they're not thermal. So if you see, if you only looked at the first term here, you might think that these are sort of boring thermal states at some uh, adequate temperature. Uh, but, but in reality, there are uh, subleading corrections here that, um, that are universal and that describe the formation of this quantum matter correcting code. Okay, so um, this is all extremely interesting from a theory standpoint, but, but uh, as we try to approach this experimentally, we, we run into some problems. So this is due to the fact that all of this interesting phase structure only arises in uh, individual many-body states that you can obtain uh, 
after you know getting some sequence of measurement outcomes. So for example, here, uh, imagine we have three measurements in our uh, little quantum circuit. Uh, each one of them uh, may give, give us, for example, spin up or spin down as an outcome. And, and in doing so, it splits up this um, tree of possible many body wave functions. Uh, and, and then it, this, this process is repeated with every measurement. So that at the end, we have an exponential collection of possible many body states. And while um, each one of them, or at least you know, almost all of them display this phase structure, um, their stochastic average, so if you simply add them up stochastically, I get a density matrix that doesn't show any of this, that, that simply corresponds to dissipative dynamics and at late times approaches uh, that entity. So it won't know about the phase transition, it, it won't know about um, all of these universal features. So this is complicated because uh, if we're naive about this and are simply trying to reproduce one of these wave functions um, over and over, uh, this is exponentially hard because there's exponentially many of them that are random. And so uh, if you don't do anything very smart with these measurement outcomes, uh, you're going to have to uh, try over and over again until you get lucky and get and get this particular trajectory um, you know, many times. Uh, so this is an exponential overhead in the number of measurements, which if we have a finite density of them, uh, becomes exponential in the, in the space and volume of our circuit. So number of qubits times circuit depth. And um, to be... To be very blunt, this is a terrible scaling. It's worse than classical simulation. So it's an example of quantum disadvantage, if you want. Right? Um, so it's imperative to find ways of, of doing better than this and, and make this physics accessible. So there are various proposals out there on, on um, some, some, some cases of, of these dynamics. But the one that I'm going to uh, focus on is one that we uh, proposed recently, which is based on the idea of space-time duality. So uh, in, in simple terms, the idea is to consider a one plus one dimensional quantum circuit and exchange the arrows of space and time. And, and in doing so, we obtain a different circuit, which genetically uh, is not unitary itself. Uh, and we can try to study this non-unitary circuit by uh, using things we've learned about uh, you know, unitary dynamics. So uh, similar ideas have been uh, studied in a variety of, of contexts before. So for example, other work on dual unitary circuits that uh, Tomas is going to talk about uh, tomorrow uh, is in a, a special case of this in which the dual is itself unitary, which is, which is possible, even though it's, it's a, a special condition. But also uh, um, you know, for genetic circuits, um, you may learn about, um, say, uh, local relaxation or, or uh, many body localization by looking at this uh, transfer matrix or, or uh, you know, influence matrix type object, which is ultimately a kind of non-unitary evolution in the space direction. So these approaches have been used to um, learn about the unitary dynamics from this auxiliary non-unitary object. And our approach is completely opposite. So we want to look at the space of monitored circuits. So everything you can make by uh, arranging unitary gates and measurements. Uh, and we want to use our knowledge of unitary circuits, which are a special submanifold of this space, where you turn off all the measurements, and use them to learn about these uh, different circuits, which are genuinely monitored, um, but have this connection to unitary circuits through this duality. And so um, what this does for us, I'm going to just just uh, give you the, the main the main messages up front. Uh, what this does for us is it gives us many advantages both on the theory front and on the experimental or practical front. So theoretically, we can use knowledge, techniques, and um, ideas from um, unitary dynamics and and use them to gain analytical control on some of these evolutions that are that are monitored. And also, we can um, you know it guides us to discover uh, different kinds of entanglement phases that go beyond the you know, area, volume, and logarithmic scaling that we knew about. And then on the experimental front, this, this issue with post-selection of measurement outcomes gets uh, hugely improved. So there's an exponential improvement there. And also uh, what measurements you have left um, only happen at the end of time, which is advantageous for present-day quantum simulators, where it's, you know, measurements are very slow and, and it's, it's kind of, um, it's annoying to do them in the middle of the dynamics. It's more convenient to do them at the end. So um, multiple advantages for uh, experimental realizations of at least these uh, monitored circuits in this particular submanifold. Okay, so uh, to give you a bit more detail of how we can get monitored circuits from simply exchanging space and time, let's start from you know, the, the basic building block of a circuit, so a two qubit gate, uh, which I'm sketching here with two input qubits uh, 
I1, I2 and to output qubits O1, O2. That is an error of time. And, and this little symbol here denotes, uh, you know, here in the following is going to be the direction of unitarity. So if we uh, choose to interpret this gate in this alternative direction, so we're simply grouping our uh, legs of this tensor in a different way. And, and this means us permuting various indices of this tensor. And um, genetically, this, you know, this shuffles the entries in the matrix and makes it not, not unitary. Um, so given a matrix that doesn't have any special property, we can always do a, a polar decomposition. We break it up into a product of a, of a unitary matrix and um, permission positive definite uh, matrix. And this positive matrix, uh, we can think of it as a measurement. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a forced measurement because it's deterministic. It's simply uh, coming out of, um, you know, the gate U is fixed. So therefore it's the associated uh, H is also fixed. So it's a, it's a particular quantum trajectory in a measurement, if you will. Uh, and also it doesn't have to be uh, a projector. It can be anything between the entity and the projector or something that has a non trivial spectrum. So it's generically a weak measurement. But uh, nonetheless, the idea is, can we uh, use this type of, um, you know, this non-unitarity that, that comes out of this in order to simulate measurements and, uh, and, and obtain these measurement-induced phases without post-selection. And um, to give an example of, of how we, what we can get here, uh, if we take the simplest two-qubit gate, which is just the identity, uh, diagrammatically, we have an input state that, that uh, you know, on two qubits that, that um, evolves trivially. So that each qubit uh, moves forward in time, it doesn't interact with the other, and it comes out the end uh, completely unchanged. So these legs here uh, simply represent uh, Kronecker deltas on the input and output states. But now if we choose to go through this same diagram in the, in the dual direction, we find that the input state gets contracted with this Kronecker delta, which uh, corresponds physically to a bell pair state, up, up, plus, down, down. So we're taking the input state, we're projecting it, and then we are reinitializing the same state uh, going out. So in all, this gives us a projector on this particular bell state. So it's like a... It's like a bell measurement, but we force the outcome to be exactly this one out of the four possible uh, bell states you could get in a, in a physical bell measurement. So this tells you that you can obtain various kinds of uh, you know, projective measurements or, or other kinds of measurements, and you can uh, intersperse them with, with gates of your choice and, and, uh, and you can simulate various uh, monitored circuits by uh, using these ingredients. And um, so theoretically, what does this, uh, what, what does this get us? Okay, so we know that there are various universal regimes of entanglement growth in unitary circuits, um, going from uh, free fermions with disorder, which can have floquet under localization where entanglement doesn't grow past some fixed amount. Uh, then we can introduce weak interactions and we can have a many body localized um, dynamics in which entanglement growth is very slow. It's only logarithmic in time. Uh, we can, as we increase the interactions further, we can transition into a thermalizing phase where at first the um, entanglement growth is, is sub-ballistic, it's, it's bottlenecked by strong disorder, and eventually crosses over into chaotic or ballistic entanglement growth, and, and, and also potentially dual unitary circuits where, where this uh, entanglement velocity is, is maximal. Uh, and all of these behaviors can be obtained in a uh, kick dazing chain, for example. So it's, it's, very, it's a very simple model where as you make these couplings uh, clean or disordered, uh, free or interacting, uh, you may obtain all of these uh, behaviors. So given this uh, wealth of, of um, behaviors for entanglement scaling in time, can we, by using this duality, obtain a similar variety of spatial scaling of entanglement in monitored steady states? And the idea, you know, why one should expect this connection is kind of simple. You know, very naively, um, we are exchanging the uh, space and time variables. So you might think that as I'm uh, doing that, my uh, functional form of, of entanglement growth in time could map onto a spatial scaling of entanglement for, for the dual steady state. And, and, uh, and also I'm going to denote um, variables in the dual direction by, by tildes to distinguish them from variables in the unitary direction. So here we're looking at um, scaling of entanglement with uh, subsystem size at infinite depth. That's, that's what this means. So so that's an expectation that one might have, and it turns out that um, it's it's sort of mostly right, but not exactly. There is a very interesting subtlety that comes out of analyzing this problem, which is uh, basically this key technical result that allows us to, to make progress on this. And it's a mapping between this problem of scaling of entanglement in these dual circuits 
and a different problem that involves unitary evolution that's coupled to a bath. And in particular, it's coupled to a bath at, at a boundary. So we have a spin chain, uh, it's evolving unitarily in, in the bulk, but there is one spin at the edge, which is being constantly um, uh, decohered very strongly by, by a Markovian bath. And, and this entropy spreads from, from this edge into the bulk as a result of the unitary evolution and gives rise to a mixed state with a certain uh, temporal growth of entanglement. And here entanglement means entanglement uh, with the environment, right? So this is a fairly different problem than the one where you derive these uh, scalings, simply half chain entanglement entropy growth. Uh, and, and as a result, it gives us some uh, sharp and, and very interesting differences. So uh, first of all, um, you know, I want to point to one thing we get out of this mapping, which is that this sub-ballistic growth of entanglement in these thermalizing uh, Griffith circuits uh, dualizes to um, family of states with a with a scaling of entanglement in space which is fractional it's a fractional power law between uh, zero and one which is tunable um, based on where you are in this Griffiths regime and this is a very interesting scaling that um, it, you know lies outside of the uh, area law volume law or logarithmic uh, paradigms that you encounter either in Hamiltonian systems or in sort of the canonical unitary measurement circuits that we uh, you know that we, that we knew about so so it sort of broadens the possibilities of entanglement scaling by using um these these non-unitary ingredients in a, in a sort of particular way but uh arguably what i think is most interesting uh, in these results is that uh, if we take chaotic circuits where entanglement growth is ballistic uh, you might have expected that this dualizes to a, a volume law phase and indeed that's right so you have a volume law term with an entropy density that's uh, that's identical to entanglement velocity but also we can derive this subleading term, which is universal and um, has, has this form. And, and, and again, going back to what I said at the beginning about the, the volume law phase in these monitored circuits, it has a really important role in describing the um, formation of this quantum error correcting code, which makes this phase non-thermal. So this was conjectured in a variety of um, models and, and some uh, some evidence in some approximations, but this is the first controlled analytical derivation of this uh, term in, a, in, a, in such a monitored circuit. Okay, um, so to give you a bit of a flavor of how we derive this, uh, let's think of um, um, unitary. So let's take a circuit which is composed of gates that are unitary in this direction, and let's uh, introduce some initial state, which we've chosen here to be this product of Bell states. And we evolve it in this sideways direction and obtain some uh, pure product state here at the end. And we're interested in the scaling of entanglement of this subsystem A. So uh, because the state is pure, this basically means how much information is shared between uh, the qubits at A and the qubits at the complement A bar. And uh, here, a, a maybe not non-obvious consequence of having this, this unitarity in the transverse direction is that uh, all of the information that makes it from A to this entanglement cut B um, ends up encoded in the complement A bar if we take it to infinity. So normally in a unitary circuit, you can have information go uh, you know, sort of cross a cut and come back and, and go out again and so on. And it makes things more, more complicated. But here, because of unitarity, uh, we can essentially um, forget about the entire top of the circuit here, uh, because once uh, quantum information has made it into one of these qubits, it's um, guaranteed to be re retrievable in, in this um, subsystem A bar due to, you know, we can, we can show that there is an uh, isometric encoding of, of this uh, subsystem B into the subsystem A bar. So after we get rid of all that, we're left with a much simpler problem where we just have a pure state on um, this patch of space time with, with dangling legs at both a, uh, spatial and temporal edge here, A and B. And that can be, um, you know, it can be analyzed uh, more easily if we think, if, you know, if we use the fact that in a pure state, um, the entanglement entropy for two complementary subsystems is the same. So we can choose which one to trace out, um, A and B, in order to obtain the uh, entropy of A, which is what we initially set out to calculate. And it's going to be most convenient to trace out the qubits at A, and uh, to do that, we, uh, as always, we, we make, you know, we use two copies of our uh, tensor network, uh, a cat and a bra, and then we trace them out on uh, the subsystem of, of our choice, which, uh, which is this surface A. And as we do that, as we couple all of these tensor legs uh, to implement this partial trace, we can, we can now give 
a very um, sort of appealing dynamical interpretation to this tensor network that we're left with. So in particular, we have here in the bulk uh, a completely unitary evolution that's taking in some, some input state that's pure and, and evolving it in time. But here at the edge, we have um, constantly over time the uh, tracing out of a qubit and, and reinitialization of a completely mixed state, which taken together is this uh, fully depolarizing or erasure channel. And so um, as time goes on, we have uh, what I was mentioning earlier, which is this uh, coupling to a bath at the edge that introduces entropy. And then this entropy gets uh, moved into the bulk of the circuit by the unitary evolution and, and produces a mixed state whose entropy we can calculate. This is a very interesting problem in its own right. Um, um, for example, uh, in Ehud's talk from a few days ago, you might remember there was a similar setup being studied to probe the stability of measurement-induced phases to decoherence, uh, but also it's uh, it's got fascinating connections with other ideas in everything from transport to to, to gravity and so on. Um, but anyway, Mateo, in our a little less than five minutes left. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, so yeah, this is our key result where we uh, map the scaling of entanglement in in space to this uh, temporal growth of, of, ent of entropy in this um, sort of dissipative evolution. And here I'm, uh, you know, it's very helpful to be immediately after Adam's talk where I can just uh, essentially reuse all of the, uh, you know, techniques that he introduced where uh, we want to calculate the purity of a quantum state and in, in, a, in a sort of half cut entropy of a unitary evolution, this is the setup you have and there is a, a very elegant mapping to this random walk problem where uh, this entanglement cut moves backwards in time by hopping left or right with equal probability. And you can use that to compute exactly the uh, ballistic growth of entanglement um, with this entanglement velocity as a function of the Q to dimension Q. So in our setting, the entropic, you know, the, the quantity we need to compute has different boundary conditions. Um, it's this uh, unitarily evolving system coupled to this bath at the edge, which uh, the decoherence acts exactly as one of these two Ising variables, the one that is being traced out. And therefore, we can also reuse this random walk picture to, um, to obtain the scaling of entanglement. So in the bulk, the rules are exactly the same, but near the edge, your random walker can uh, try to hop outside the circuit. And, and if it does so, it gets penalized by some, by some uh, factor that doesn't conserve probability. So you have a, an actual loss of probability in your uh, in your random walk and computing this random walk survival probability gives you this uh, square root of t correction to the purity, which in turn, in turn gives you this um, logarithmic uh, correction to the entropy. Um, and here you can see there is a factor of one half, but uh, this is due to the fact that we're taking a subsystem that's near the edge of a, of a semi-infinite chain. If we took a system in the bulk of an infinite chain, we would find uh, you know, different boundary conditions for this random walk would give us this three halves correction, which is indeed um, the same as is being uh, conjectured to arise in generic unitary measurement circuits in the volume law phase. So you might ask, is this indeed the same phase or not? And to try and attack this question, we've looked at a more sophisticated diagnostic, which is a, a mutual information between some single qubit and, and, and its environment. So you take a subsystem A, take a qubit inside it, and, and look at mutual information between B and, and whatever is, is outside of this subsystem A, and, and see how it scales as you move the qubit around. And here we can compare our results on duals of chaotic circuits um, to what is found in unitary measurement ones. And indeed, this has the same uh, power loss scaling shown here. So with this, we have, uh, I think, pretty, pretty convincing evidence that these uh, you know, chaotic circuits, once dualized, indeed realize the universal uh, non-thermal volume of phase uh, that is found in unitary measurement circuits. OK, so I think I'm um, sort, sort of out of time, so I don't really have time to go into how this can be done in practice. I'll just say that it's basically implemented with a version of quantum teleportation uh, you know, based on the single qubit teleportation protocol, but turned into a many body evolution where uh, you know, somehow you're able to evolve your initial state in the spatial direction through the quantum circuit of your choice. And the cost is basically a, a number of measurements that have, that have zero density in space time and, and they all come at the end. So it's very advantageous. Okay, with this, I'll conclude. Um, I've uh, reviewed a bit on monitored circuits as a new arena for universality away from equilibrium. And I've, uh, presented our work on space and duality as uh, a route that gets you 
uh, monitored circuits that have this uh, high degree of analytical tractability that they inherit from their unitary partners. Uh, and this gets us, on the one hand, uh, new phases that uh, we didn't uh, know about before, this uh, fractional power loss scaling phases, and also uh, real, you know, controlled realizations of uh, universal phases that, that we knew about. And also uh, on the experimental front, we have uh, this, this exponential uh, improvement in the post-selection cost and this delay of all measurements to the end of time, which is a, a extremely advantageous thing for, for present day quantum simulators. So uh, directions for future research. Well, um, it's certainly interesting to enrich this uh, idea with uh, by looking at uh, correlations on top of entanglement and also by enriching it with uh, symmetries and conserved charges along the lines of uh, Sarang's talk tomorrow on uh, monitored circuits with, with charge conservation. And, and then more broadly, I've shown an example in which by using these quantum computing primitives, such as Ancilla's um, teleportation measurements and so on, we can rearrange the, the, the very structure of space-time in a quantum evolution and get different kinds of universal behaviors. And this is, I think, a, a wide open um, you know, uh, field where certainly many more things are possible and it's a very interesting uh, direction to, to look at. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I want to thank Tibor and Vedika uh, at Stanford for, for their collaboration and, and also uh, yeah, flag the references again. Uh, thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions.